Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In this episode, I'll talk about an introduction to English language study or the study of English language. It is actually a first chapter that was assigned by Professor Riyad Alamidi, uh, the Dean of the University of Babylon, to the PhD program students. So I've been assigned to do an introduction to the study of language and I thought of doing it a little bit differently, so I'm shooting this video for this reason. The study of language can be divided into multiple sections uh, and it took so many complications over the course of the years. There is horizontal progress in the study of language and there is vertical study. Vertical study of language is something called philology and it's actually st started or triggered the concepts of the study of language and it's the foundation, the fields of language. Uh, for example, the study of semantics, the study of syntax, the study of morphology, the study of phonetics and phonology, all are divisions and subdivisions of the current modern shape of study of language that took over from the basic concepts or philology of language, where the scientists in the early 1900s, actually it is the time that triggered the official conceptualization about the study of language, and uh, most of the scientists at that period were interested in understanding uh, how these languages, uh, how these languages come to be as they are, uh, what is the prototype Indo-European language that just shaped the current modern uh, sub uh, sub languages that we see, like Spanish, English, uh, or other uh, languages that are prevalent in the world right now. There's actually more than a hundred official languages. There's actually thousands of languages, but the most common spoken languages in the world are a uh, few to philologists uh, primarily speaking try to understand how words had changed and what kind of reasons shaped that change in language and by what principle and they also try to understand why the proto consonants changed into the germanic ones over the course of the years uh, some of these scientists try to study uh, words and languages in isolation uh, some of them uh, i mean philologists try to understand the concepts of languages from the uh, from the perspective of agglutinizing and inflecting uh, sentences and inflecting uh, words uh, to name few to understand if the affixation or inflection has changed uh, the concepts or shift in languages but all of these felt into disagreement eventually uh, because uh, the parties that were competing against to show their theories of why these words uh, came to form languages that are ultimately separate did not find a common agreement. Uh, that's from a philology perspective. Actually nowadays the study of language has taken many shapes, especially in the Western world, due to the advances that have been made scientifically speaking in the field of language study and language discoveries. Um, it is uh, it goes without saying that the concept of language has devolved, uh, evolved into many concepts and subcategories that I previously mentioned in the beginning of this video, but it's really worthwhile to understand if you are a ma amateur student or you're an advanced PhD or master's a degree student to understand the trajectory by which languages took sh uh, the, the modern shape right now. So there's few he headlines that we need to highlight in order to understand how language uh, came to be as it is right now in the modern uh, study of linguistics. So these are key ideas that I wanted to highlight uh, from the book of Samson. Uh, that are related to the study of language. Sam Jeffrey Sampson in 1980 wrote a book called The Schools of Linguistics. In this book, um, he highlighted uh, some outstanding aspects of the study of language and the progress of the study of language. So I just thought of summarizing these highlighted uh, topics um, in his uh, book because it is one of the requirements of the study of language in our field and the PhD program in Babylon University. Uh, the first highlighted concept is that it is never easy to understand the novice ideas that were presented in the field of linguistics without understanding the common climate 
political climate, the social climate that surrounded these ideas at the time that these ideas were presented. So we need to consider sociolinguistically speaking and socially speaking, politically speaking, the ideas that were prevalent in tandem or in parallel with the linguistic thoughts that were presented at that time, whether that's the 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, starting from the structural and functional um, aspects or schools of language up to the generative. Uh, we need to understand that the study of language did not begin in this century. It began around the year 1900. And from that period, the shift and pioneering of the study of language took place in the Western uh, world. And that time marked a turning point in the study of linguistics and in the study of science. At that time, linguists shifted their attention drastically from the study of the philology of language to the study of the intricacies within the language and the evolution of languages themselves. The next highlighted point in this chapter of the study of language is that when de Saussure came to be known and famous because of the publication of his lectures by his students, he said that language history passes in relevance of the players and he viewed it as a play of chess where the history does not move in the same way that the players are moving. So for example, when we use the word uh, high-handed and to sketch some possibilities that for example, if the word um, high-handed is gone, we will extend the usages of words like arrogant and presumptuous to use them in instead of this word. In addition, he viewed language as a play of chess, where the history does not move in the same tandem where the players are playing. And he gave that example, and these sketched examples caught attention of the scholars of the modern uh, era in the Western world. He gave another example, if we drop the, uh, the F in the word belief, people will still understand what you're talking about, so I believe, but if we drop the first consonant here, B, the meaning of the word will drastically change. And he highlighted the same concept that if we drop the first uh, sound of the word belief, that the word is going to be shifted. This is her suggestion was very national, actually, because he talked about the Lange parole. Lang is the the wholeness or the entirety of the uh, lexicon that the one has in his mind and the parole is the amount of the spoken words that are uttered by the speaker. According to this sir, he viewed language as a science and that evolved into the study of semiology and he, viewed, and he considered that all the components of language like the chess play all the components of languages uh, are moved in, and affected by the adjacent move of the surrounding uh, component. So if one of the concepts is gone, uh, the concept will be shifted to the next one and will be affected by this move. Eventually, he thought that language is a matter of possibilities, or the study of language is a matter of uh, studying possibilities that surround language. And if you want to understand language, you have to understand it from the adjacency of these pairs or these words as they are used in the context and how they are affected by the possibilities that are surrounding them. Another key idea from Dissasser is the uh, idea of signified and signifier. And he thought that uh, the fusion of the signified and the signifier in the lexicon or in the mind of the speaker will generate the meaning that is um, uttered. But one of the problems with uh, Dissasser is that he was a philologist, he was not a philosopher. So the justification that he presented at that time were not. Uh, quite acceptable in the field of philosophy. However, it just uh, was welcomed to a large extent because there was a scientific study and scientific approach later that discovered that every lexicon that is generated, every parole, every kind of concept that is uttered is coming from uh, another uh, idea that is infused with it in the mind and the lexicon of the person. And that was uh, a concept that was uh, welcomed to high extent by the structuralists at that period. We can say that the 20th century enterprise of linguistics is completely unrelated to the previous schools or enterprises that just uh, happened to be in the 1900s. And uh, the modern school of linguistics uh, pioneered by Noam Chomsky are kind of irrelevant to the previous enterprises that 
uh, pioneered the field of uh, linguistics before. Now, Samson mentions in his book of the schools of linguistics that the modern shape of linguistics and the modern shape of the study of linguistics, what we call it synchronic linguistics, is not seeking the connection between one language and another as much as it's seeking to reach a communicative purpose of why this language is shaped this way and how it is shaped, what the components of uh, this language like semantics, syntax, phonology and tries to understand the connection between these um, subfields or subcategories or subdivisions of language to reach to an understanding of the homogeneity of this language or the heterogeneity of this language component uh, to what comes to be a communicative system that happens to be at certain points in time. Now, the modern shift from philology study or diachronic study to the synchronic study happened to be first in Germany, then it flourished in Indo-European languages, and then it shifted to the West world and to UK and to the United States, and it sought to much extent, the study of culture, the study of roots, the study of uh, the popular uh, ethnicities that just contributed to the shaping of language as much as not being influenced by other languages that surrounding it or adjacent another. to it. There's another highlighted point. We can say that the philology of language or the study of the history of language is inferior to the superiority of the modern synchronic study of language. We're just saying that uh, as I mentioned previously in the, uh, in the video, that it was affected by the laws that were prevalent in physics and uh, sciences at that time in the early 1900s. Previously, in the historical study of language, language was viewed as an organic or organism that lives in the microcosmic uh, atmosphere or the microcosmic um, environments that surround it. So it gets gestated and then it matures and then uh, it uh, goes through the process of growth and then finally it gets to a point of extinction if it's not used. Jean Podwen Courtney had another tendency to suggest that there is a humanistic shift or humanistic tendency to the study of language or to the learning of language, where he said that the velar pharyngeal languages that prevailed in the Semitic languages, represented the beastly mode of language, and then the modern humanistic approach is taking more consonants and vowels that are uttered in the lapial, the frontal aspects of the mouth. So this shift from the back of the mouth to the front of the mouth is just a humanistic tendency to modern shape of language. Now, uh, that was just a quick summary to some of the highlighted concepts in the chapter one of the study of linguistics or the schools of linguistics that that is a book by uh, Jeffrey Sampson that was published in 1980. Uh, uh, it's a little bit philosophical and complicated book to study, but these were highlighted concepts that I just wanted to mention to you. Uh, one final conclusion is that the study of modern synchronic uh, aspect of language rather than uh, the historical aspect of language was because of the tendency in the current era or the modern era to study and focus on the concept of language as it is uh, right now instead of uh, studying it in connection with the previous approaches or the historical approaches or philologists approaches to the study of language of where this language is coming so they they are right now studying the language as components and its components structures and how it is formed right now internalized in the mind and con conceptualized and then formulated and spoken later on. That was just a quick review of the of the chapter. I hope it's useful to you. I hope uh, I just had a different way of presenting this topic to you and it's useful. Stay tuned for other summaries in the future, inshallah. Have a wonderful day.